Welcome to this special podcast edition of Louisa May Alcott is My Passion. I call you friend, though you lived long before me. It's your words, your wisdom shine through. I am your host, Susan Bailey. Today, I have the distinct pleasure of presenting to you an interview with Anne Boyd Rue, author of Meg, Joe, Beth, Amy, The Story of Little Women and Why It Still Matters. Published by W.W. W. Norton and Company, this book has received positive reviews from the likes of The New Yorker, The Atlantic, Newsday, The Wall Street Journal, and Publishers Weekly, sparking a serious review of Little Women's important legacy. Recorded the week of the annual Summer Conversational Series at Louisa May Alcott's Orchard House, Anne and I discuss different aspects of her book. I hope you enjoy our conversation, and we'll pick up Meg, Joe, Beth, Amy at your favorite bookstore or online on Amazon or Barnes & Noble. This book has so much in it that it's impossible to cover everything in, you know, a half hour, 45 minutes. So what I thought I would do is to focus on the part, the the thing that I usually kind of focus on on my blog, and that is the biographical aspect of the story. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to start with a quote that you had on page 9, where you say, as a result, for Louisa, writing could never be a purely artistic affair. Mm -hmm. She was realizing her dreams of independence and supporting her family. So, do you think she would have attained the success that she had had she not faced the headwind all of her life of trying to provide for her family? Mm. Well, in some ways that gave her the motivation to write, Mm -hmm. right? It made her so productive. Um, So I think in some ways it contributed to her success. Um, She was trying so many different styles um, in an attempt to see, you know, what, what people would respond to. Um, and I think that by writing in so many different genres, I mean, the if you look at the thrillers, they obviously do inform the children's fiction in some respects, right? It kind of made her, in some, in some ways, a more well-rounded writer. Um, but at the same time, it's, it is kind of um, interesting to imagine what her career would have been like had she not had those pressures to crank out so many what you might call pot boilers, right? The sensation mm-hmm. fiction, even though she enjoyed it, was clearly an attempt to earn money mm-hmm. for her family. The children's money, ob- or the children's literature, obviously was uh, um, was an attempt to, you know, feed her family and you know provide for her nephews and niece. And so, it's you know I think she probably would have written more works uh, like Moods and Work if she'd had the capability to do so. Um, and even though her children's fiction is so beloved, I think it would be nice to, to have more of the adult stuff, too. I agree. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, the recent discovery of manuscripts for some of Alcott's other books dispels the notion once and for all that Louisa did not edit her work. Yet you discovered this, too, in the only surviving manuscript for Little Women. It shows her evolution from a writer of thrillers to a writer of children and young adults. Describe what you saw with these edits and how the story evolved from them. Well, there are only two chapters. Mm -hmm. They're at the Concord Free Public Library. They've been there for so long that the curator, Leslie Wilson, doesn't even know how they got there. Okay. Wow. So they've been there a long time. Mm -hmm. Um, I think people didn't seek them out. Well, first of all, because people think, oh, Houghton is where everything is. But actually, no, there's all these great manuscripts at Concord Free Public Library. Also, there's been such an assumption that she just dashed things off so quickly. If you look at her journals, you see that, yeah, she was writing these these novels really quickly. But um, if you actually sit down and compare, there are two chapters. One is the heartache chapter in which Joe turns down Lori. The other one is Foreign Correspondent, which is Amy writing her letters home from Europe. And in those two, uh, on the back of the the Amy chapter, she has written in her own hand, saved by mother's desire. 
So obviously Abigail was fond of these chapters and she saved them because otherwise uh, Louisa would destroy the proof, destroy the manuscripts once the proofs were created. She had no more need for them. And certainly I don't think she had any anticipation. Well, actually, no, that's not true. This was the second volume. These are both from the second volume. So she would have known how popular the first volume was and that her story was so popular. But maybe didn't anticipate that manuscripts would be so, so desired um, in her own hand. They're, they're, the, the ink is rather faint, so they're kind of hard to read. But you will notice, especially in the Amy chapter, significant changes from the um, what we have in the book. Um, Fred Vaughn, for instance, um, does not follow her to Europe, does not seem on the verge of proposing. In fact, she leaves him back in London. We never hear about him again. She never contemplates marrying for money. Okay, so that's a big difference. <coughs> Instead, there's this Captain Lennox, Lennox guy that she picked up on the boat who follows her over and is like a you know sick puppy dog, can't get enough of her, and is jealous of all the German boys serenading her and uh, clearly wants to, to propose, and she's trying to put him off. She has no interest in him. So it's a very different dynamic, very different Amy. Um, in the heartache chapter, uh, she crossed out a couple of things where Lori clearly is in that scene, uh, not taking no for an answer, and he grabs her and he kisses her. And I think what I see happening in, in these chapters is her adapting her stuff. This is her first children's book. And so she's realizing, oh, I need to tone down the passion a little bit, the flirtation with men a little bit, right? The kinds of things that might have been more acceptable in her sensation fiction, um, which she was quite used to writing. So I think part of it is a style issue, and part of it maybe is, um, you know, wanting to kind of pull back from fully exploring the these girls as becoming sexual beings, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So which is kind of an interesting, I think, dynamic. That insight about her toning down her mm -hmm. thrillers writing, mm -hmm. it, you know, it seems like if you don't know the inner stuff, it seems like she's leaping from one thing to the next and how the heck did she change from being, yeah. you know, a writer of Pulp Fiction right. to somebody who wrote wholesome children's stories. Right. So it's interesting to see the process. And I mean, yeah. here again, we have this, this seems to happen so often in uh -huh. Alcott scholarship and maybe all scholarship. It's right there in front of your face, right. but nobody ever looked for it right. or looked at it. Right. You can't say I discovered them. No. Because they've been there all the time. And I know that there's at least one other Alcott scholar who, who mentioned that he looked at them, mm -hmm. um, but maybe didn't spend the time comparing them to the original. I don't know exactly. But but frankly, no one has spent much time with any of the manuscripts yet. Um, and and they, they're, people are starting to do so now, I think. Right, yeah. yes. Yeah, so particularly I'm, with I'm, that discovery of, of um, what was it, Eight Cousins? I think they have a whole well, manuscript and for that. Right, maybe. It, well, Under the Lilac is the one they purchased last oh, year. Oh, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. For a, a, a quite significant but undisclosed sum, apparently. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> right. I can imagine. That's a huge fine. Right, So, right. Excellent. Okay. Um, you have an uncanny ability to say what we've all been thinking but have never bothered <laughs> to put into words. Insight so obvious, yet never identified. For example, you say that Bronson was a sort of religious fanatic. These two words, at least in my mind, opened up a new understanding while answering many questions. Yeah. You also pose the most obvious of questions which no one has ever asked. Quote, what could possibly make a man so obstinate that he was willing to allow his own family to starve? There is no simple answer. Please comment. <laughs> I said there was no simple answer. Come on. <laughs> no, well, there isn't, but I... No one's I ever know. said that. I read that, and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> right, it's so obvious. <laughs> exactly. Right? Yeah. I think, well, there was a there was an expression. I didn't use it in the book, but there was an expression in the 19th, 19th, um, 19th century, uh, one-idead men. Mm -hmm. So in, in an era of reform, right, mm -hmm. there were lots of men who had a sort of, you know, there, there was one thing, education or abolition or temperance, and you know, that's all they would talk about. Mm -hmm. They were just so possessed by their cause and wanting to reform it. And, you know, Emerson and others kind of made fun of these one-idead men. Well, I, Alcott, I think, was kind of made fun of for, for being um, so single-minded in his devotion to his principles. Now, they aren't as easily, we can't just, you know, sort of boil them down to one idea, mm -hmm. like, you know, education or temperance or something, because he believed in some ways in all of those things, right? 
you feel like you're tempered. Right, exactly. In a, in a broad sense, not just alcohol. Um, but all forms of temperance and moderation. Basically, I, I kind of, the thing that made most sense to me was understanding that there's a letter he wrote to the girls when they were young where he says, um, you know, he's sort of imploring them, expecting them really to model themselves on Christ. Mm-hmm. You know, living a Christ life like is it a Christ like life as if that were so easy and possible, right? Right, right. <laughs> we would think of it as a sort of superhuman or, you know, beyond human, you know, capability. Right. But for him it was it was not only possible, it was very attainable. Mm-hmm. And so he was trying to live like Christ and he expected those around him to live like Christ, which means basically is doing all material uh, desires, right? Yes. For food, <laughs> mm-hmm. for luxuries, for material possessions, um, and to live a sort of simple, self-sacrificial kind of life. Yeah. Yeah. When you compare him to Christ, mm-hmm. which he did think of himself as being like Christ, and you you trace Christ's ministry and what he did, and he basically was com- very dependent upon women to provide for his needs. Ah, good point, yeah. And, right. and yeah. you know, as he said at one point, he had no place to lay his head. Mm-hmm. So if, if Bronson was modeling himself after him, and yeah, of course yeah, yeah. Christian too in Pilgrim's Progress, right, exactly. then yeah. it, it starts to make sense. Right, because he thought the Lord will provide. Right. And the Lord will probably probably provide primarily through women, <laughs> right? But that, that the women or the people around me will take care of me if if the Lord wants me to thrive, right? Right. And so at Fruitlands, when everything, you know, goes haywire and, and they can't support themselves and, you know, they're practically starving and winter's coming and setting in and he re- and everybody's leaving and he realizes it's a failure, he's just lost his will to live because right. that means that the Lord does not, did not provide, that did not, you know, view him as uh, this is a worthy endeavor and he put all of his eggs you know, into that one basket. Uh-huh. And so it took Abigail, you know, kind of all practically carrying him to the wagon to say, you know, we're going to, we're going to get out of here. We're going to move <laughs> to a house. We're going to carry on. We're not just going to roll over and die. Right. But that, um, and that was a very significant moment too, in terms of, of, you know, kind of giving them this sense that the family ultimately did have to stick together because he right. was talking about going off and living with the Shakers right, and yeah. all of those things. And so it, it, it was, you know, pretty momentous, and he got, it sounds like he, after the Fruitlands failure, there was a period of him really believing that he was Christ, and then things kind of mellowed over the years. So right. after a while, maybe they could eat some cheese <laughs> or whatever, right? <laughs> I couldn't help thinking at any time that, uh, quote, the Lord did provide, that Abba would kind of think to herself, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Almost aggravated that it happened to yeah, the it, Lord. And, yeah, and I know. Quotes, right? <laughs> it's true. Um, Beth. Yes, we're talking about Beth. Yes, uh, I. Um, you had alluded to Beth being more complex than originally thought, and you and I have talked extensively about this and have reached similar conclusions. Mm-hmm. What do you see in Beth that readers have missed, and how does Lizzie's own tragic story inform your conclusions? Well... I, I have a chapter on growing up female mm-hmm. in Little Women, you know, sort of thinking about the way young women are growing up today, comparing them. And, of course, Lizzie doesn't grow up, okay, which is a tragedy. But I couldn't help seeing, and I couldn't help but see her as not just a victim of her fate, right, that she's got a disease and she's going to die, but there seemed to be a kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for, a kind of desire almost, Um, maybe that's too strong of a word, but there are these passages where she talks about not even being able to ever envision herself in the future, right, 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 that she, that she could never go there, and what she's not able to envision, in other words, is her life as a grown woman, in a grown woman's body, you know, bearing children, you know, being a wife, all of the things that, you know, that are that are messy and complicated for women. And by pulling back from that, and, you know, I think it's possible to read her as pulling back from that, not mm-hmm. just saying, oh, I can't imagine it, but saying, I don't want to go there. Right, in <laughs> right? other words, it was almost a choice. Almost a choice, possibly. And it's clear from the book that, 
that her illness has psychological dimensions because Marmy talks about how sad uh, Beth is and she worries about her spirits, about her mood. Um, and so it's not just, you know, it's not just a physical illness. And there, there are references to food and to starving that suggest that, that she might be um, withholding nourishment from herself. Mm -hmm. And and actually, if, if you if you look at some of the literature on anorexia and the history of it, I mean, she really fits in the patterns, yes, right? Yes, she does. And, and including religious devotion. Yes. Um, and this kind of saintly, you know, angelic image of Beth. Yes. Um, that she's too good for this world and all of that. So I I wanted to put that in there as not that this is the I figured it out. This no, is it's, Beth it's is. a suggestion. It's a suggestion that there's there's another way to think about Beth that makes her a more complex figure. And I frankly think Beth is more complex than we give her credit for. She's been dismissed time and time again. I've had oh, students say infuriating. Students say such horrible things sometimes. It's really just, infuriating. Oh, I can't stand Beth. I wish she would just die already or something. <laughs> and I think that is so just harsh and callous. And you know, there's more to Beth than I think people have realized. She's not just a goody two shoes. She's a she's a very sensitive uh, person who's suffering a lot. Suffering a lot, yeah. yeah. And I mean, yeah. in, in Lizzie's case, her suffering was very, very real. Right. I mean, it, Louisa Gloss is over that, you know, because it's a children's book, but in real yeah, life, exactly. she lost all her hair, she weighed yes. like less than 80 pounds, she was... Well, the fact that she, yeah, Lizzie, the real Beth, died of a wasting disease, and that's all we really know. Mm -hmm. We don't know exactly what caused the wasting disease, right? But we know she was skin and bones when she died. Right, yeah. and if we're going for a psychological cause, yeah. I think there's plenty. It, again, it's another one of those things that's in plain view that nobody has ever right. sought to. Well, look at how the family was. I mean, you know, Bronson Alcott was encouraging them to restrict their eating um, and the way that they, you know, the kinds of foods that they ate, mm -hmm. um, and you know that they were supposed to deprive themselves. That was their religious, spiritual mission was to deprive. Well, themselves. right. He was fat. He practiced fasting, and Lizzie very much embraced, you know, her mm -hmm. father's teachings, and so that would make sense that she would, to please him, right. would embrace that herself. Another thing about eating disorders is, is uh, I remember reading in uh, Megan Marshall's book on the Peabody sisters, mm -hmm. and she mentioned about Sophia and mm -hmm. how she used invalid, in, being an invalid to speak, you know, to, to make her voice heard yes. above the noise, above all the powerful sisters. Right, right, right. And we've got a situation here where oh, we've got three, similar, yeah. Yeah, uh, three powerful sisters and one who felt she didn't have a voice exactly. or didn't feel worthy to have a voice we don't know why right, right. but and in Beth's case too yeah. she doesn't say a whole lot either so I, she wants she wouldn't let her family read her journals whereas right. the rest of the girls had to open up their journals all the time I thought that was very very suggestive of how um, well that's all, almost an open yeah. act of rebellion because it really is yeah. because Bronson is saying oh there's no secrets you know there's no secret corners of the mind you have to share he, he did say in his journal that he respected her decision but I, I often have thought to myself the conundrum that she placed herself in by not allowing her journal to be mm. because she was she displeasing him. She closed herself off. Too, but, the, yeah, but, the, yeah. but the conflict that yeah, that must have caused, that's true, yeah. there's a lot more there. There is a lot more there, and it's unfortunate that... Yeah, that we don't have more, that we can't read and read her journals just like her family couldn't, right? In some right. ways, Beth will always remain a bit of a mystery. Yeah, or Lizzie, Lizzie slash Beth. <laughs> um, limiting Meg's interest in the theater. In reading Joe's Boys, Meg reveals a far deeper interest and even ambition to be an actress, much like her real-life mm. counterpart, Anna. Your conclusion as to why... I'd like to hear your conclusion as to why Louisa decided not to reveal that part of Meg in Little Women. It does make sense. Right. I think that um, I think that she. It was such a taboo thing for uh, for women to act at that time, even though they were doing it a lot of times in neighborhood theaters or in their home. Um, to be an actress commercially, to have a career. In fact, there's a story. I'm trying to remember the name of it now that was published shortly before Little Women that features four sisters. Some of them have the same names. Um, they all, in that story, one of them does pursue the stage. Mm -hmm. And she's the one who ends up, you know, sort of a tragic tale. Right, because yes. Because the man, yeah, she falls in love with the man that I think she's, you know, he's in the company or something. 
and he rejects her because she, clearly because she's an actress she can't be a pure woman if she's an actress and so he goes and falls in love with some simple little thing oh, right. <laughs> right yeah 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 so it it, it you know in, in a children's story at least, uh, certainly louisa explored the tensions you know around women acting in other pieces like behind a mask is another good one right um but in her children's fiction i think she felt like that was probably too controversial and so so sadly meg doesn't have a talent that she's nurturing that she's you know that she's ambitious about the way the other girls do that's true yeah, yeah. that's absolutely true um, in your presentation, you mentioned, uh, this was the other day, you mentioned how Amy's ambition to be a great ar artist evolved into making herself a great work of art. <laughs> in the process of doing this, doesn't she also do that for Lori? Absolutely, yeah. Well, she's making herself into a perfect work of art to be admired by men. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, no doubt about it. She admires herself, though, too. She admires, I mean, she... She loves beautiful things, right? And so by turning herself into a beautiful object, I think it's something she appreciates, but at the same time, she knows it's appealing to others, men and women, but men in a particular way, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is something that I think, at least from you know, the author's perspective, you think about Alcott looking at May and how May is developing into a young woman. Right. Because when she wrote Little Women, you know, May was still... She wasn't young, but she was still, um, she was not settled in life. She was adrift say. for many she years. Stripped, she yeah. really was. Yeah. 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 And so she, she noticed the way that, that May was so attractive, you know, attracted a lot of attention from boys, from men. And I think that, um, you know, was developing her interest in art and everything. And I think what she does with her and Little Women I sort of combine those, right? And she doesn't, she she lets Amy give up her ambitions so easily. I know. Whereas in real life, May didn't give up her ambitions. In fact, she became such an accomplished artist. And, you know, I think that it's it's kind of unfortunate that Amy wasn't allowed to do more of that. Yeah, it's almost like Louisa didn't think May was going to yeah, she do that. Yeah. Yeah, but then, of course, that would have almost been out of type with the character of Amy. Well, and she felt such a pressure to marry them all off, right? So she right. had, so she kind of wore herself into a corner of, oh, well, I've given Amy and Joe these ambitions. What am I going to do with them if right. I have to marry them off? And I think in Amy's case, it was she, it was the easier route to take to just have her say, oh, I'm not a genius, you know, so right. I'm not going to be an artist, which is really sad because Joe, from the beginning, acknowledges I'm not a genius, right? right. And I don't have to be a genius to still have ambitions and want to better my writing and mm -hmm. you know, do something with it and express myself. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's very yeah. interesting. Um, finally, on the movie adaptations, I was really fascinated by how you connected the various movies to their time period. So in other words, the 1933 Catherine Hepburn movie, you attached it to the Great Depression. The 1949 June Allison movie, you attached to... Uh, post-World War II, mm -hmm. uh, 1994, and then, of course, we have the recent Masterpiece yeah. series. So mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could elaborate on that a little bit. Oh, that's, yeah. Well, the, I think what, in some ways, what we see happening over the course of the movie, movie adaptations is the, um, the girls becoming more and more real in each adaptation. Oh, yes. In some respects. Mm -hmm. Um what, what I really notice so much about the 49 in particular, but also in the 33, is the way that, well, definitely the 33, the Catherine Hepburn, Joe, the way, actually in all three, okay, I'll just say that, mm -hmm. um, in all three of the movie, the main movie adaptations, Joe is, is not the way she is in the book, in the sense that in the book, she is this wild cult of a girl, she doesn't care that boys look at her, right? She's not even trying to attract their attention. She and Amy are polar opposites in that respect, of course. Mm -hmm. And she's just doing her own thing. She is herself, and she's even telling Lori all the time, stop looking at me that way. Mm -hmm. You know, she puts her pillow up. She wants to hold, you know, fend him off. Um, and she just wants to develop and grow and be herself. Well, in the movies, what you see happening is either early on in the movie or in the case of the Katherine Hepburn character, 
she uh, is like that in the first part of the film, but as soon as she meets Professor Bear, oh, suddenly she turns into this, you know, the, I think it goes soft focus even on her, and <laughs> her voice gets higher, you know, she's no longer this tomboy, you know, marching around, she's like, oh, Professor Bear, yeah, okay, she gets all doe-eyed, and in the in the 49 film, you really see all the girls doing that, oh, they're looking at men with this, you know, they're like, almost batting their eyelashes. <laughs> they're very conscious, in other words, yeah. of the male gaze. Okay, mm -hmm. They're very conscious of the, the camera's gaze. They're very conscious of them being pretty. And in the 49 film, they uh, with the addition of color, you know, each of them is really dolled up with ribbons and makeup and, oh, yeah. you know, all these different colors. And then in the, 40, in the 94 film, I think that's supposed to be the feminist version, right? Right. That's supposed to be the one in which the girls can you know, put all that behind themselves and they can really be, you know, themselves and be individuals. But I don't think that's happening either because they cast in the role of Joe, a Winona writer who can't help but be beautiful and be loved and adored. And she grew up with a camera in front of her. Right. And she became, you know, you see her on camera and she's constantly looking that way. Just, you can tell how aware she is of the attention she's getting for how beautiful she is. Mm. And in her interactions with Lori, I mean, my students notice this because we'll watch clips from the film. And they're like, oh, she's like teasing him. She's like egging him on. And then she suddenly says, no, I don't want to marry you. She's like touching him, you know, stroking oh, his arm. I never noticed And looking that. longingly at him. She can't help it, apparently. And then what I loved about this recent BBC adaptation, and maybe it's the fact that Maya Hawke has not grown up in front of the camera, is that she's not doing that at all. No, no, she's not. She's not. She is a real girl yep. who is just being herself. And, mm -hmm. is, and that's what Joe is supposed to be. And I feel like she's the first true Joe on film. I agree with that. I, yeah. I think that's absolutely true. I, I have to say that I thought that the, uh, I can't remember the name of the actor who played Laurie, but he, to me, he was perfect. I mean, he yeah. had the right hair, he had the right <laughs> look, <laughs> and he was hot. He, he was, was hot, so cute. and it was tough to see him spurned when he was. <laughs> it really was tough. I, I'm thinking to myself, you fool. <laughs> <laughs> right. But then again, we have Professor Bear, who is adorable. So. Oh, the youngest Professor Bear yet. Yeah, I was curious about that. And the, he doesn't they... really look, I think, like what Alcott depicted. No, I little, don't he's, either. He's a little too young, a little too cute. But I get it. I get it. And I think that Gabriel Byrne was an adorable Professor Bear. Yes. Um, yeah. And, and made that role, I think, a, a bit more accessible to us or imaginable to us as well. Sure. Understanding why Joe would like him. Yep. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for this time. And, and uh, you can find Anne's book on Amazon.com. It's Again, it's called uh, Make Joe, Beth, Amy, The Story of Little Women and Why It Still Matters. This is a must-have, <laughs> <laughs> and I congratulate you and wish you luck. Oh, thank you, Susan. It's been a lot of fun talking to you. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. The storm is thank you for listening to this special podcast edition of Louisa May Alcott is My Passion. You can purchase Anne Boyd Rue's book, Meg, Joe, Beth, Amy, The Story of Little Women and Why It Still Matters, on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. The links are in the accompanying post. You can also find it at bookstores. Visit Anne's website at anneboydrue.com to see her book signings and speaking engagements. You can also sign up for her wonderful newsletter, The Blue Stocking Bulletin. Until next time, let's all do something splendid. <laughs>